So I'm going to tell you why at the tender age of 38, I decided that we needed to create a new field, right? So I am trying diligently to create a field of study for black men and boys that I call black male studies. And I created this by accident. Black male studies started off as an academic argument. I thought I was making an intervention into history by just trying to show people that black men were victims of rape during slavery and Jim Crow. And it was just that. It was only that. Just an academic argument. Until I started actually meeting black men who were victims of rape. Who were raped by their mother's friends, teenage girls, or other men who lived in their own neighborhood. Your whole life changes when you hear grown black men holding back tears or speaking through the pain of physical, sexual, or domestic abuse at the hands of black men and women who should have loved them, cared for them, or at the most basic level, not harmed them. But what theories do we have to explain this? What theories do we have to understand how black men and boys suffer? We often ignore the vulnerability of black men and boys in this society. We consume so many images of black males as dead flesh, as corpse lying in the street, that we become numb to all the factors in society that dehumanize black men and boys before their death. Since the dawn of slavery and throughout colonization, black men and boys have suffered horrible sexual violences and mutilation. We imagine lynching, but can we imagine the rape of young black men by white men who chain these black boys to their beds? Or white women who rape the most brutalized and isolated slaves for their own sexual pleasure? A history of America as a British colony was mired in sexual exploitation and violence. And we accept this when we think about black female bodies but we resist this. We deny that it's even possible when we talk about black men. Throughout history, racialized males have been the victims of homoerotics of white supremacy. We hear of young black boys who are raped by white women. We hear of young black boys raped by white men with clothes hangers. We hear of young black boys like Darren Manning, whose testicles were squeezed so hard by a female police officer that he swears that he heard an audible pop. Or in my field, you have to exist in a world with white women philosophers who rape disabled black boys and claim it was because they were in love with them. We should understand, like Baldwin illustrates in his short story, Going to Meet the Man, that racism is a carnal hatred. It's a sexual hatred. And that we've been mistaken and short-sighted in our denial of this kind of violence towards black males. When I was six years old, the first gunshot that I heard woke me from my sleep. It was a shot fired by a black woman who lived two or three blocks away from my home. She killed her husband because she believed that her husband had been cheating on her. My mother told me that the man was innocent, that this was wrong, that he didn't deserve to die. But I've been haunted by the sound of this gunshot since I was a small child. Imagine if we believed that black men were actually human beings that could be harmed by other people and not just bullets. Could we imagine a world where black men were victims of domestic violence and intimate partner homicide without saying that they weren't the cause of their own deaths? What would it mean to imagine black men as human beings? Black men and boys experience some of the harshest social conditions of any group in the United States. Despite their trauma, their witnessing of or their experience of violence, Black males are only classed as perpetrators of violence. In The Mark of Oppression by Vesey and Cardinier, two white psychoanalysis committed to understanding sexuality in the Negro in the 1950s, they suggested 
that black boys have little use for masturbation, which usually started around the age of six for white boys, because black boys often lost their virginities between the ages of seven and nine to usually much older adolescent girls. Because of hypersexualization, we are often blinded to the sexual vulnerability of black males. So the fact that black boys experience statutory rape, sexual coercion, sexual manipulation, more than any other group of males, not only goes ignored, but is often adamantly denied any time it's discussed. The vulnerability of black men and boys, the vulnerability that they have to physical abuse at the hands of their mothers and their fathers, it remains invisible. Even though they often receive the most severe forms of abuse when compared to their female counterparts. Think about that. Nobody sees it. When they're sexually abused by older women, we claim that it did no harm to them. We say despite their tears as grown men, that they actually wanted this sexual assault as young boys. So while we made this own racist caricatures of black men and boys as super predators, we simultaneously imagine them as voids, vacuous figures that we're fine not knowing about. We don't care about how they suffer during their lives, but we love performing outrage at their deaths. Black men are coping with a very public and deliberate strategy to crucify them in America. These negations of black male life cause depression, it causes stress, and poor health outcomes. That's why we die so early. Even when black men suffer depression, it can actually be masked by a high-level coping strategy that's often called John Henryism, whereby these men use work and an exhaustive dedication to specific goals to cope with the psychological and cultural assaults associated with their racial and sexual oppression. Those old black men who just sit on the steps, they don't say anything. They die before everyone else. Jim Sidanius is one of the leading scholars in social dominance theory. What his research has shown is that black men, as well as other outgroup men in Western patriarchal societies, are targets of lethal violence and extermination by dominant racial groups. This is a particular and unique type of oppression for racialized men that we often don't discuss. So then when we think of incarceration and police brutality, we're talking about strategies that have been cultivated in stereotypes that are propped up by cultures that rationalize black males as being dangerous from birth. So studies looking at the perceived formidability of black males have not only shown that black men are thought to be more dangerous and aggressive and larger, and even that black male sounding names trigger the survival instincts of whites, but even that preschool age black boys are tracked by their teacher's eyes more than any other group, even their black female counterparts. So said differently, black men are thought to be undesirable and perceived as threats as, from as early as preschool. But then we ask, how, how do black men live in a world that's so committed to their deaths? As scholars and thinkers, we have not yet begun to understand the relationship between life and death for black men. How do black men think of their death? Is it, a, in fact, a welcome escape from this world? Do they live with the idea that they're, in fact, dying before us? Do we even know enough to understand what we do not know about black men and boys? That's why I created Black Male Studies. Because Black Male Studies is an attempt to understand the racial and sexual oppression of black men and boys as a form of dehumanization, a living death, so to speak, that precedes their physical deaths, which we pay so much attention to. Before we can solve the problems confronting black men and boys, we must first ask the right questions. Can we as scholars, as thinkers, as non-white people who claim that we're anti-racist but are still afraid of black men, right? Can we imagine them as being vulnerable? Can our gender theories 
become driven by empirical and verifiable data, where our efforts to study black men and boys become rigorous, rather than merely our phobias of them pretending to be theory. So what black male studies is trying to do, what black male studies does is it refuses the pathologization of black men and boys as theoretical advance. And it proposes, imagine this, it proposes the empirically informed accounts of black male life. It's indisputable value as the basis to condemn and actually object to black male death. Thank you.